Alan, the theory of inflation and cosmology, which you discovered, is one of the greatest uh, achievements in, in human intellectual history. How did this happen? What does it mean? Take us on your journey. Okay. Uh, first of all, a lot of things happened that led up to this, which is important. Uh, I first learned about something called the flatness problem, which is crucial in, in the ideas of inflation, uh, from a lecture that I just happened to wander into in the fall of 1978, uh, given at Cornell by Robert Dickey. Uh, this flatness problem is the statement that to get the universe to come out right, to look anything like what we see now, if you look back at what things must have been like at one second after the Big Bang, the expansion rate has has to have been just right, or the mass density has to have been just right, uh, to an accuracy of about one part in 10 to the 14. Otherwise, the universe either rapidly recollapses or expands so fast that no galaxies form. This idea struck me very much at the time. I was uh, bawled over by it, uh, but um, had no idea really what to do about it at the time. I just tucked it away in the back of my mind. Uh, also in the fall of 1978, the other important event that got things rolling was a fellow postdoc of mine at Cornell named Henry Tai uh, came to me one day and asked me about magnetic monopoles and grand unified theories. He had said, well, why don't we try to figure out how many of them would have been made in the Big Bang? At first, this idea sounded crazy, and he really had to twist my arm uh, to get me to work with him on it. When we did, we discovered that the universe would be swamped with magnetic monopoles if one combined standard ideas from grand unified theories with standard cosmology. So that led us to start to scratch our head about whether or not there's any way to modify standard cosmology uh, to make it consistent with grand unified theories and the observed absence of magnetic monopoles in the real universe. We came up with the idea that these magnetic monopoles would be extraordinarily suppressed if in the early universe there was an extreme amount of supercooling going below the temperature of the phase transition without the phase transition yet happening. We assumed that this supercooling would have no effect on the expansion rate of the universe. In our calculations, we just put in the standard expansion rate. And then the real excitement happened one night when I went home and looked at the equations that described how mass densities affect the expansion of the universe, which are all really standard equations of cosmology. And it became immediately apparent that the consequences of this supercooling would result in a form of matter that would really turn gravity on its head and cause it to become repulsive instead of attractive, and that that would propel the expansion of the universe and perhaps even explain why the universe uh, was expanding, which is what became the theory of inflation itself. And I realized that same night, it was extraordinarily exciting, that this process of exponential expansion would actually solve this flatness problem. The expansion rate that's driven by this gravitational repulsion is just the right rate yeah. to drive the universe to this critical density that the universe needed to have uh, to extraordinary accuracy uh, in the early period. And in describing that feeling, what did you write in your diary? Well, I, it wasn't exactly my diary, but on the page that I was doing the calculations yeah. on, uh, I wrote when I realized that it would solve the flatness problem, spectacular realization, and put a double box around it. And and as far as I know, it's the only time I've ever put a double box to anything. <laughs> I, I was immediately excited about it. Uh, but I was also immediately worried that, you know, it was just too simple, too obvious, too wonderful uh, to be true. So what happened the next day and afterwards? I uh, roughly did the calculations that night and then probably slept a little bit and then work, woke up excitedly the next morning and uh, bicycled to my place of work, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Uh, and I did make a note in, in actually, it was my diary that uh, I broke my bicycle speed record that morning. <laughs> <laughs> then I started telling people about it and some people got very excited. The next important event was really just a few weeks later when I was having lunch in the Slack cafeteria. People began talking about something which had been mentioned in a recent paper by Tony Z called the horizon problem, uh, the problem of how the universe got to be so uniform, which I had not recognized was even a problem. But it turns out to be very hard to understand how the early universe got to be as uniform as it apparently was. It really doesn't make sense in the context of the standard Big Bang model. Uh, but as soon as I heard about it, I realized that inflation would solve that too, uh, because this enormous period of expansion would mean that you'd be taking a very, very tiny region of the early universe and stretching it out, and very, very tiny regions are usually uniform. Uh, and then when you stretch them, this process of stretching would maintain that uniformity. I gave my first seminar about this at the end of January of 1980, 
at Slack, and that's where the excitement really started. I got a very positive reaction from the audience, and by that spring, inflation really had permeated the, the U.S. physics community. And since then, inflation has really been come to be a, a, a standard part of the, the theory of how the universe was created with more and more observational and indeed experimental data that supports it. Uh, that's correct. And so far, the observations are just wonderfully in prediction uh, with, in fact, the simplest versions of inflationary models. So it's been a remarkable success and amazing. I just love it. <laughs>